Well, hello and welcome back to the One Year Bible Journey. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel. This is the One Year Bible Journey, especially for beginners. And you are listening to the New Testament commentary on week 15. Welcome to week 15. Congratulations for sticking with the program. I'm enjoying it. I pray you're enjoying it. We're learning a lot and we're unpacking a lot. So yesterday we were reading actually this week, Judges 6 to 20. That's the Old Testament reading. Your New Testament reading this week is Luke 22 to John 2. Uh, These are long chapters, but otherwise a relatively short span of the New Testament. And we're going to cross over into a new gospel today, which is always exciting. It means you are finishing um, another one of the longest books of the Bible, Luke. So you're going to Luke 22 into John 2, and then Psalm 45 to 47. So in this video, uh, we're going to focus briefly on the last two cha- three chapters of Luke, and then the first two chapters of the Gospel of John. And I'm so glad and thankful for the privilege of uh, walking down this road with you. And I encourage you, don't get discouraged and stick with it, even if you're surveying, even if you're listening on double speed. Uh, getting through the Word of God is a good thing. And as you work at it and stay together on the videos, even if you fall behind a week or two, that's not a big deal. It's better to consume the Bible at whatever pace you can uh, stay faithful. And this kind of thing is the kind of thing that if you fall off the wagon, you just stand up and get back on. No harm, no loss, just press forward. And I'm so glad that you are on the journey. Okay, so today you're going to open to Luke, or this week, Luke 22. And you're kind of picking it up during this last week of the life of Jesus. But when you turn to chapter 22, you're really on the last evening before the crucifixion and the the day of the crucifixion coming into uh, Jesus being nailed to the cross. Chapter 23 is when he's actually crucified. So this, I want to comment about this first. This is the third time that you will have read the account of the crucifixion. And I was thinking before the video how remarkable it is. You know, there's so many aspects of the Bible there's only one account of. For instance, we're reading Judges in the Old Testament. We just read Joshua. There's really only one account of the entering and the settling and conquering of the land. There's really only one account of the spiritual deterioration of the people of Israel immediately after the generation that settled the land. So many things are said in the Bible one time. And and if it's in the Bible one time, it's in God's word one time, it's important. But what about those things that are in the Bible twice or three times or four times? And, you know, when you come to the life of Jesus, four times the story is told from different perspectives, different witnesses, validating the story. It's like like, um, events of a traffic collision happening and you get eyewitnesses from four different corners of the accident and you're able to stitch together and harmonize all those eyewitness accounts. And there's a strong case. Why did God give us this four times? Well, number one, he's wanting to validate the eyewitness, the validity, the substantiation of our faith. These events are not fairy tales or made up stories, contrived, no. These Gospels were written when the witnesses were alive, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses that could validate these stories. This is not a man-made story. These are witnesses telling the story of God. This is the story of when God visited planet Earth and what he did for us. And so Matthew accounts, Mark accounts, and now Luke. And Luke's account is made up of many witnesses, many eyewitnesses accounts coming together to contribute to Luke's gospel. So God's emphasizing this story three times, four times. You're going to read the crucifixion. You're going to read of the last week of Jesus, uh, the resurrection, and the final days of Jesus four times in scripture, four different vantage points, four different witnesses or sets of witnesses repeating the, 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 the key components of the story. It is a st- substantiated, it is a val- validated faith. I love that. It also is a point of emphasis. So anything the Bible says two or three or four times, uh, you can say this is the most important content in the narrative. 
And when you come to the last week of Jesus' life, Jesus in Jerusalem, Jesus teaching in the temple, Jesus with the Last Supper, the crucifixion, the trials, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, these details are emphasized four separate times. And so uh, God is not only validating with eyewitnesses, he is emphasizing this is the pinnacle moment of Scripture. This is, I mean, maybe the next, you, you want to say it's all super, super important. You know, like how can you differentiate what's the most important? Well, certainly the crucifixion and resurrection, everything hangs on that. Everything leads up to that. Everything comes out of that. And then I would say second would be, if not tied, would be the book of Revelation, the culmination of all things. Jesus Christ revealed and his kingdom consummated, his coming complete, the work of redemption, the story uh, finalized. So it just doesn't get any better or any more important or significant than what you're going to read today. So chapter 22 is the Last Supper, Luke's account of the Last Supper. And Jesus shares this meal with his disciples that we've talked about twice already. And then he journeys out of the upper city, down the Kidron Valley, to the Garden of Gethsemane. There he begins to pray and suffer and agonize for you and for me. He is then arrested. Peter denies him during his first trial in the house of Caiaphas. He's beaten, he's rejected, he's mocked, he's scorned. This is chapter 22. You come into chapter 23, Jesus has now been tried two times, once with Caiaphas, once with the Sanhedrin. Then he's sent to Pilate in the beginning of chapter 23. Pilate is the Roman governor of this region. And Pilate doesn't want to deal with him, so he sends him to Herod, the king who's in the area for the moment, probably because of Passover. And then Herod doesn't want to deal with him, and Jesus doesn't give Herod any information. So he's sent back to Pilate. Pilate, against his will, it relents. It's a complicated scenario politically, as we've already talked about. Finally gives in for Jesus to be crucified commands that he's crucified, washes his hands of the situation. Jesus is then laden with his cross after being flogged and beaten, and he's a brutalized, bloody mess at this point. He carries his cross as long as he can, and then he is assisted by Simon of Cyrene. And they take him to a quarry outside of town, and there he is voluntarily, he voluntarily lays down his life. He opens his palms to the nails. He is crucified for you and for me, and he suffers on that cross. So you start the Last Supper in chapter 22 on Thursday evening, and Jesus is on the cross at 9 a.m. on Friday. And uh, we just came through Easter weekend and resurrection, and we just came through Good Friday a week before the recording of this video and uh, every year about this time social media kind of comes alive with uh, what day of the week was Jesus crucified and I have really spent an enormous amount of time studying this and I am personally convinced that it actually happened on Friday morning at 9 a.m. If you have a different opinion that's just fine um, we'll all find out in heaven one day but there's real good reason to believe that uh, that Friday at 9 a.m. is the time. Every other scenario pretty much has him rising on the fourth day. And, uh, and Scripture says he rose on the third day. This is the third day since these things happened. And early on the third day. That's important. So um, anyway, that's just a side note. Uh, at the end of the day, what matters is that he was crucified. As you're reading chapter 23, I want you to... First of all, contemplate. You know, Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. One of the reasons this is accounted for four times in Scripture and then many other times it's referred to is that God doesn't want us to forget about this. We are prone to forget. We're prone to wander. He wants us to remember this. He wants us to live at the foot of the cross. He wants us to live under the remembrance of the great love that Jesus displayed for you and for me. As you're reading this, I really want you to think, Jesus did this for me. He did it for me. His love for you is incalculable 
It is infinite. It is unending. It is surpassing any love you've ever experienced in your life. The God of all creation, wrapped in human flesh, voluntarily laying down his life, suffering, brutality, bleeding, and dying. And he did it for you. He did it because he loves you. And my friend, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I just want to say, you need to. That death applied to your account doesn't happen automatically. And that death applied to your account is all that can bring you. It's the only thing that can bring you to God. It's the only thing that give you can give you forgiveness and grant you the favor and the grace and the blessing, the salvation of God. You don't get that by communion. You don't get that by sacraments or catechisms. You don't get that by confession uh, to a priest or a pastor. You don't get that by just attending church. You receive it by faith, by placing your trust in Jesus alone, not in a tradition, not in a ritual, not in a ceremony, not in a church or a pastor or a priest, in Jesus alone. And if you've never made that decision, I hope as you're reading this and as you're hearing this video today, you'll come to that moment where you'll look up, cry out from the depths of your heart that you'll say, Jesus, come into my life and save me. Be my personal savior. There is no greater decision. So Jesus is crucified. He gives up the ghost. He cries out, it is finished. And he is now on the cross. And uh, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, I should say, with the help of Nicodemus, asks the body, they take Jesus off the cross. They quickly prepare his body for burial. They lay him in Joseph's borrowed tomb. And then they go to celebrate Passover. Jesus is laid in the tomb before sunset on Friday. Uh, so Friday is the first day. And Saturday is the second day. And Sunday is the third day. So that's why I believe Friday at 9 a.m., among other reasons. So Jesus, by the end of chapter 23, is laid in the tomb. And then you turn the page to 24. Chapter 24, and you're going to read again of the resurrection. Now you're going to read, um, Luke's account of the resurrection is very, I just love it. It's I think it's my favorite of all of them. I love all of them. But I love Luke's account of the resurrection. I especially love the story of the disciples, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're so discouraged. They're so devastated. And Jesus comes walking and they don't recognize him. And he's asking them what's going on and he's leading them in this process of discovery. And he's dealing with them so tenderly, so thoughtfully, so lovingly. And he's so far ahead of them. I just, I love it. It's just a picture of my life. I'm on this road through life. It always doesn't, it doesn't always work out the way I want it to. Um, sometimes it's hard and discouraging and depressing. And I wonder what God is doing. And all the while he's right there. He's talking to them. And you just want to reach into the pages and go, guys, he's, slap him on the face and go, look who you're talking to. <laughs> wake up guys he's here um but they're so sad their dreams are dashed their hopes are crushed they just think it's all over and he just lovingly begins to teach them and you know i've been talking about these landmark these critical cornerstone verses that you come across throughout the narrative of scripture we've seen them in every book of the bible we saw them uh, yesterday in judges and and I'm going to give you a couple more right now, okay? These are nuclear verses. So Jesus is talking to the disciples on the way to Emmaus. And it says in verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Why do I say this is a cornerstone? This is a nuclear, this is a foundational or a, uh, you know, a, a, a critical verse because Jesus now opens the Old Testament scripture, uses the Old Testament scripture that we are reading in our Old Testament journey. 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's Moses. And all the prophets, that's so much of the rest of the Old Testament. And what does he do? He expounds, he teaches the Bible unto them in all the scriptures. Now that would include all the scriptures, all but the New Testament, because the New Testament isn't yet written. All the scriptures, the things concerning himself. I've been telling you for weeks now that all of the Bible is about Jesus. It all points to, it all leads up to, it all culminates in, it all represents him, it all leads to him, it all points to him, it all shows the need for him. When he arrives, everything after him flows out of him because of him, because of what he's done. Jesus is the centerpiece. Jesus is on every page. In some way, every single part of Scripture points to Jesus or flows from Jesus. And you say, Carrie, that's just your opinion. It's not my opinion. It's Jesus' opinion. It's how he taught the Bible. All things concerning himself. He says this again. I want you to see this again in verse 44. This is now later in the day. Jesus is with the disciples. So cool. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you. So this is what he's been doing for three and a half years. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So all the law of Moses, all the prophets, all the Psalms, that's essentially all of the Old Testament. He says, it's all got to be fulfilled because it's all about me. I'm going to keep reading for a second. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. This is the very end of chapter 24, and it's so critical. Jesus says, all the story is about me. Now that you know that, and I'm opening your eyes and your understanding so that you can understand the scriptures, now go and preach this message. Tell this story among the nations beginning at Jerusalem, and go be witnesses of all these things. That's your commission. That's my commission. Commission, But he says at the very end, don't do this without the power of, of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So this is such a powerful part of Scripture because it's the end of Jesus' earthly life. It's the great commission to us as his followers. But for me, and I love this, this these two verses tell me that all of the Bible is about Jesus. And that's what I mean when I say gospel-centered, gospel centrality, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of the scripture. All of it points to the gospel. All of it flows out of the gospel. All of it is built on the framework of the gospel. And we talked about that at the beginning of yesterday's Old Testament video. So such a powerful conclusion to Luke uh, and Luke's gospel. Very briefly, let me visit with you about the book of John. And I'll spend a little more time going a little deeper next week. You're just going to read the first two chapters of the book of John, the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call synoptic gospels because they're very repetitive. They're interlaced and overlapping. They tell the same stories in, in from a different vantage point. John's gospel is a standalone. Now, it's not to say there aren't repeated accounts of certain stories. There are. But by and large, John covers large sections of Jesus' life that the other three Gospels does not cover, do not cover. And he, he covers certain stories and miracles that the other three Gospels do not. Um, and he approaches it in a way that the other three Gospels do not. John's journey is a personal account. John is, you could say, he's the best friend of Jesus. He was perhaps the closest of all of the disciples to Jesus. Uh, many believe he was the youngest disciple, that he was like a teenager. Uh, there's a real good chance he was the cousin of Jesus. 
And he also becomes the oldest and longest living apostle. Uh, The Apostle John writes the book of Revelation when he's about 95. So he outlives all the others, which, again, gives good reason to him maybe being the youngest. Um, And John approaches this uh, differently than the other gospel writers. The theme is that this is Jesus, the Son of God, not just a good man, but the God-man. John uses the same words over and over again. And he uses the words truth, belief, and life, and love. Those four, truth, belief, truth, belief, truth, belief, love, and life. And here's how it goes. John says, I'm writing truth, logos, the sum total of all reality, all logic, all reason. Logos is a Greek word, and it's the root word of logic knowledge. So the truth, Lagos, I'm writing to tell you about the truth so that you'll believe the truth. And when you believe the truth, when you receive the truth, the Lagos, when you understand the Lagos is a person and he's knowable, you believe in him, you meet him and you encounter his love. The truth is a person and that person is love. He embodies love and he loves you. And when you accept that love, you receive his life. And the word that John uses so often that Jesus used for life is the word zoe. In the Greek language, now in Aramaic, I'm, I'm not sure, but in Greek, there Jesus would have spoken in Aramaic, but John would have written in Greek. But John breaks up the uses for the words life because there's three or maybe four Greek terms for the word life. The first is bios, that's your physiology, your physical, like biology. The second is suke, that's your psyche, your inner, your soul, maybe is a biblical term for that, your inner, your identity, your inner self. But the third word is zoe, and this is abundant life. This is the word that Jesus used when he says, I'm come that they might have life. It's real life, it's quality of life, it's abundance of life, it's eternal life. It is a God kind of life that comes alive in us when we believe in Jesus. So John, throughout the whole gospel, he's saying, I'm telling you the truth so that you'll believe, you'll place your core trust in that truth and encounter the love of God and the life that Jesus wants to put in you. That is the purpose of John's gospel. And you're going to see this all throughout the gospel. He is building an ironclad, rock-solid argument that Jesus is is the God-man, this book, maybe more than any other, establishes the deity of Christ in clear, no uncertain terms. I mean, absolute, rock-solid, Jesus claims over and over to be the great I am, to be the Son of Man, the Son of God, uh, to be the God-man visiting planet Earth. Um, So John records a lot of miracles that are highlighted to define Jesus' power as the Son of God. John never identifies himself as the writer, but he does uh, clearly present eyewitness accounts, and he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, which is so cool. It's not to say that he would have thought that Jesus didn't love the other disciples, but John had come into this identity of defining himself by one that's loved by Jesus. <laughs> and, and if I'm loved by Jesus, then everything else is secondary. Like, if, if Jesus has set his love on me, then nothing and no one can take that away. So it's a great day in all of our lives when we become so secure in the love of Christ that it just defines us. Who are you? I'm the one Jesus loves. Uh, that's a great place to be in life. And so you're going to read in chapter one what I like to call the cosmic view or the heavenly view of the Christmas story. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And you're going to continue reading about this heavenly view of the incarnation of God on planet Earth. In chapter two, and I encourage you to take your time and play this out in the DVD player of your mind, Jesus does his first miracle at a wedding. And I love this story. I love the play between uh, Jesus going to the wedding. That's, a, that's amazing with his disciples. Mary being there, 
the trouble of running out of the wine and what did that mean for the culture and the embarrassment of the groom and Jesus is going to save the day, but he's not going to really take credit for it uh, publicly, not vastly. And just a few people are going to know what he did. Uh, Mary tries to get Jesus to do, to fix things and Jesus makes her know, hey, I'm not here on your will. Uh, This is all done in the Father's time. And then he turns around and (laughs) and he does the miracle anyway. It's It's just an awesome, awesome story. One of my favorite parts of the story is uh, the servants who fill the water pots, the pots with water, you know, that that they actually go and do the work, this, this simple menial task, and then they actually draw it out and serve it to the governor of the feast, the, 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 the master of ceremonies. They serve him the water that he's expecting it to be wine. What faith they had to go put water in these pots and then to actually serve it as though it's wine. So cool. Um, and how God uses their faith, and how Jesus um, saves the day, but gives the groom the credit. I think that's really cool. Jesus does the miracle, but the groom and the family of the groom who put on the wedding, um, they they get the credit for for the miracle. Uh, so it's it's just a great start to the ministry and the life of Jesus, and it really shows his heart, his celebratory heart, his loving heart, his gracious heart, his generous heart. Uh, you know, so many people think of Jesus as a prude or a killjoy or some kind of ethereal, you know, above everything. No, Jesus went to a party and he celebrated marriage and he blessed a bride and a groom and he made the party even better. Um, I probably should interject here that I do not believe that Jesus created strong alcohol. Okay. I think the Bible warnings against strong drink are many. I don't think Jesus would turn around and give something that was likely to make people drunk. Um, and the new Testament tradition would have been this. They didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have the purification methods that we have today. And so it was typical for them to take water and mix it 10 to 1 with fermented grape juice, wine, alcoholic wine. But the 10 to 1 properties, 10 parts water, one part wine, here's what it would have done. The fermented wine, the alcohol, would have killed any remaining bacteria in the water. It would have essentially purified it and made it drinkable, and it would have given some flavor. But the 10 parts water would have diluted the intoxicating properties of the wine so that you could consume pretty good amounts of it without any fear of intoxication. These people would not have wanted to become intoxicated. Jesus would not have wanted to create something that made them intoxicated. Even though they would have been celebrating, I don't believe this is a recipe for drunkenness. I just wanted to insert that because in the modern vernacular, when you talk about Jesus turning the water to wine, a lot of people get the image of a 21st century bottle of wine, and that's just not um, the reality of what's going on here. But nonetheless, Jesus is at a party. He is celebrating. He is blessing. He is eating. He is drinking. He's enjoying because he's jovial. He's enjoyable. He's fun. He invented fun. He invented celebration. He is a festive, jubilant God, and I'm glad to know him, and I know you are too. So uh, right after the wedding, Jesus goes down uh, after the first miracle, goes down to Jerusalem for the Passover, and he clears out the temple. He does this twice in his ministry. Uh, He drives out the money changers, takes over like he owns the place because he does. The temple is where God meets man. Temple is wherever God occupies, and man is able to come into his presence. So in this moment, the temple isn't even the temple anymore. Jesus is the temple because God has inhabited a human body. And uh, he's driving out the false religion. And the story that we've read three times now starts all over again through John's eyes. And you're just going to have a full cup. I do want to comment before I go that we are studying the Gospel of John on this channel. And so if you want to sidebar, you know, parenthetical study all the way through, verse by verse, through the Gospel of John, you can go to the playlist, Jesus Up Close. And then finally, I want to remind you that the Dunn book, which God has used this in the lives of tens of of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people over the last 20 years. It is a short account of the gospel. What most religions never tell you. 
uh, so many thousands of people over the last 20 years have reached out to me and said they read this book and they trusted Jesus as their Savior. So many friends of mine have said, I gave this to my family member, to my coworkers, to my neighbors, and they trusted Christ as Savior. And it said they, that it answered so many questions for them. If you have a heart to witness, if you have people you love that don't know Jesus, but they don't want to talk to you about it, they don't want to argue with you about it, they're afraid or intimidated, or you're intimidated maybe, to talk to them, this will empower you. Just take the book, give it to them and say, read it and let me know if you have questions. So uh, we make these as affordable as possible and God's blessed and used it. It's available at inthegospel.com. This is the new second edition and it really turned out well. I'm thankful for it, happy about it. I'm happy for how God's already using it and the good feedback we're getting. Maybe give a copy to your pastor or to someone that, and you know, the best way to buy them is in in a box, in a case. I have so many friends that buy them a box at a time and just continually give them out. Uh, Some people uh, just do different things with them, leave them at hospitals or doctor's offices or leave them out at work for free for the taking. I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll let you go. I took these uh, to the car dealership the other day when I was, uh, when I was picking up my vehicle from the shop. And uh, when I went back later, uh, a couple of guys at the, at the shop said, Hey, I read that. I read that book. Thank you for that. Can I get some more copies? So um, anyway, I'm not just trying to sell something. God has used this book to get the gospel to many people and maybe someone you love could be the beneficiary. So uh, that is uh, our day today in the New Testament, the book of John and Luke uh, in the one year Bible journey. Thank you for taking the journey with me. Uh, Let your questions be aired below and, and your comments. I love to interact with you. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.